All right. Good morning again. Welcome to our services. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open to the book of Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, uh, verse number 28 is going to be kind of our key verse, but I want to go back and read the whole chapter. This is entitled Joshua Part 2. Okay, So we're again in a character study, and again, I don't like to call them characters because these are real people, but we're studying their characteristics, so I guess we could call it a character study of the person of Joshua in the Old Testament. Last week we talked about his first trait, and anybody remember his first trait? When he was told to go fight the Amalekites, he obeyed. Obedience was his first trait that we looked at. It's kind of where we found Joshua just coming in and, and being commander of the army of Israel. But you know, obedience can be done in resentment. You can obey somebody and, and not really want to do it. I know sometimes maybe this side of the, the uh, <laughs> sanctuary this morning, your mom and dad tell you to do something, you don't really want to do it. Sometimes it can be done out of resentment. And I'll do it, okay, fine. You know. But obedience must be coupled with something else so that it is something that's not burdensome or uh, causes one to be resentful. And that something is love. Okay? Love produces a loyalty. When you're thinking about uh, in the New Testament, Paul several times wrote that, the whole law was fulfilled in basically love. And if you just love, you will fulfill the whole law. Joshua was not only obedient, but Joshua was loyal. And Joshua, as we see, was loyal both to Moses and he was also loyal to Jehovah. And we'll take a look at that both today. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open to Numbers chapter 11, and we're going to begin in verse 1, and I know it's a long reading. We're going to read down through the chapter, but hopefully you'll, you'll be intrigued about what Israel is doing. Numbers chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in their uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taberah, because of the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed and the color thereof as the color of bedellum. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell. Let's grasp what's going on for just a minute. What is Israel doing? Complaining. They're complaining in the wilderness. We find them first complaining and then God kind of gets their attention a little bit, sending fire in the uttermost part of the camp. And they cry again and they pray and they have Moses pray for them, and Moses prays for them, and the fire is quenched. And then right after that, what do we find? More complaining. <laughs> okay? The mixed multitude. Those would have been some Egyptians, other people that left with Israel when they came out of Egypt, maybe some other slaves, some other people that came. So there's this mixed multitude of people that come out, and they're saying to the people of Israel, Boy, you remember the fish that we had back there in Egypt? Do you remember the melons that used to grow there by the Nile and the cucumbers that we had and all the good food that we had back there in Egypt? And the Israelites began looking around going, you know, we did have that fish back there and that was pretty good stuff. And all we got now is manna. You guys remember what manna is? What is it? That's exactly what manna means. What is it? We don't know what it is. It's just this stuff that falls from heaven. God told us to eat and it's good stuff to eat. It's kind of like a bread, as you mentioned. But 
they, they would grind it up and they would make cakes out of it and different things as we read there in verses 7 and 8. But you see the Israelites, they're listening to the mixed multitude. Now, let's remember, where are they? They're in the wilderness. How much food is in the wilderness? Not much. <laughs> and you got, well, you got three million people or so out there camping out in the wilderness. And you're going to feed them all. And they're complaining about the food. And they're complaining about the food choices. And they're complaining and complaining and complaining. Everybody is complaining. Not only is the nation of Israel complaining, let's continue reading. It says, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that they should have said unto me, Carry them thither in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the suckling child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Whence should I have flesh to give all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. Not only is Israel complaining, who else is complaining? Moses, the leader, is complaining. He's complaining to God, isn't he? God, this is a whiny bunch of people you left me with here. And they're looking to me, and they want me to give them all this flesh. And where am I going to get flesh in the middle of this wilderness that you put me in with these people, Lord? You can hear him complaining, and he's crying. And he says, I'm not able to bear it all by myself. And if I'm going to have to do this, Lord, just kill me and take me home because I'm tired and I'm sick of this, and I don't want to put up with these people anymore. Everybody, you know, complaining is contagious, isn't it? <laughs> Everybody's got something to complain about. So the people are complaining. Moses is complaining. And we go down through and we see, well, God's going to take care of some things. All right, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou shalt not bear it thyself alone. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves for the morrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt, therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it come out of your nostrils as it be loathsome unto you, because ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? Okay, God, God's going to answer their prayer. <laughs> not the way they think. First of all, what is God going to do for Moses? He says, Gather seventy elders of Israel, Bring them to the tabernacle. I'll take of the spirit of wisdom that I've given unto you, and I'll give it unto them, and they can help you judging Israel so you don't have to do it all by yourself, whiny Moses. Okay? And then he says, now you turn around you tell the people, you want meat? Okay, you can have meat. You're not going to have it for one day or two days or a whole week. You're going to have it for a whole month until what happens? It comes out your nose. You're going to be so sick of this meat because you're going to have so much. It's all you're going to have to eat. Now, I'm a pretty simple person. I like to eat the same thing just about all the time. You know, I can have the same thing for breakfast all week, and I can have the same thing for lunch all week. But, you know, some people are not that way. They like to have variety in their life. And these Israelites, they were wanting variety in their life, weren't they? We want the meat that we had back in Egypt. Oh, my God's going to say, okay, I'll give it to you. You're going to be knee-deep in the stuff. It's going to be coming out your nose. They were complaining, complaining, complaining. But again, we're going to get to Joshua here in just a minute. All right, and Moses said, The people among who I am are 600,000 footmen, and thou sayest I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Now, this is where Moses is complaining again. He's going, Lord, you're promising these people meat for a whole month, and where am I going to get it from? 
What's Moses forgetting? It's God. <laughs> God's the one that's going to provide. He says, shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall not come to pass unto thee or not, or shall come to pass unto thee or not. So God had to remind Moses, the leader of Israel, God can still provide. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them and they were of them that were written but went not unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses, saying, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the, high ser the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Okay, you got to remember, what did God say? God said to Moses, choose out 70 men who are elders of Israel. And bring them to the tabernacle. So, again, we're, we don't get all the time span here. But evidently, Moses went through and picked out 70 men and had them written down which 70 they were going to be. Because you notice it said there that they were written, but they didn't go out to the tabernacle. Okay? These guys had been chosen to be part of these 70 leaders who were going to help Moses. And they were supposed to go out to the tabernacle of the assembly. They were supposed to go out to where the Lord met with the people. But these guys, me, dad, and El dad. They stayed there in the camp. Okay? So they had been chosen to serve, but they decided for some reason they didn't go out to the tabernacle. Whether they thought that they weren't worthy, as some people say, or, or maybe they just didn't want to go serve, or maybe they were cowardly, or who knows, maybe they were sick that day. I don't know what the situation was. All I know is they didn't go out. And now God pours His Spirit out upon the 70, and because they were included in the list, God also poured the Spirit out on them, to again be leaders in Israel to help Moses. And all these guys, when they received the Spirit of the Lord, started to prophesy. They started to speak forth the things that God wanted the people of Israel to hear. And they were all supposed to be at the tabernacle, but these two guys are in the camp. And they run somebody out to Moses and say, Moses, Medad and Eldad, they're back in the camp prophesying. And Joshua speaks up. And Joshua says, what? Forbid them. Moses, you got to stop this. Moses, you can't let these guys do this. Why would Joshua not want other people prophesying? Who was Moses, or who was Joshua loyal to? He's loyal to Moses. Look at verse 29. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? And Moses got him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Moses kind of rebukes Joshua a little bit because he says, Are you doing this just for my sake? Because again, who was the leader in Israel? Moses. Well, it's supposed to be God. You're right. It's supposed to be God. You're right, Sister Karen supposed to be God. And Moses had been complaining. I need some help. I need some help. I need some help. Now God gives him help. And Joshua says, Moses, you're the man. You can't let these other people take any of your glory. You can't let any of these other people stand up to be leaders in Israel. Because Moses, you're the leader in Israel. You're the one that everybody should look to. You're the one. So Joshua is loyal to Moses as the leader. Nobody can prophesy like Moses can. What does Moses say? Joshua, I wish everybody would be as close to the Lord that they would prophesy and do what God would want them to do. Moses wished that all would be as close to God in such a way. So Joshua's loyalty is to be noted. He was very loyal to Moses. But there is a more important loyalty that Joshua had, and that was to Jehovah 
himself. Let's go over to Numbers chapter 13. We're right here just across the page in my Bible. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 8. We looked at this one last week because we said, what tribe was, what tribe was Joshua from? Ephraim, verse 8, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshe, the son of Nun. And again, remember, that was where his, his name is changed. We go down to verse 16. It says, these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land, and Moses called Oshe, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. His name meant salvation, and now his name is changed to Jehovah saves. And then it's just kind of shortened to Joshua, which is, again, Jehovah saves, just abbreviated. Okay? So Israel, if you think about it, has a real short memory. Because these guys are sent to spy out the land, okay? And they're going to come back and report to the rest of Israel what the promised land is like. Okay? And let's go down chapter number 13, and let's begin uh, verse 26, okay? And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they, that is the twelve spies, told him and said, We came unto a land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwelt in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So most of the spies are saying, yeah, this is the wonderful fruit of the land, but there's no way we can get it because there's all these giants in the land and all these warrior people, and there's no way we can go into the promised land. And Caleb, verse 30, stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw there are men of great stature. And we saw there the giants, the son of Anak, which come out of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. There's no way we can do it. We are but grasshoppers. And notice they said, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. We looked and we compared ourselves to them, and we're just grasshoppers compared to these guys. They are giants. They're huge. They're big warrior battle people. And there's no way that we can take the promised land. Israel had a very short memory. Anybody know how long it had been from the time of their release from Egyptian captivity to the time they got to Kadesh Barnea? Anybody know how long that period of time was? Two years. Two years. They spent some time around Sinai and they went some different places, but about two years to get from Egypt to Kadesh. And what had been happening for those two years? God overthrew the Egyptians. God provided for them in the wilderness. God led them through the wilderness. How did God lead them through the wilderness? You guys remember? Hmm? He fed them. There was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and they were supposed to follow that. You see, we call it wilderness wanderings, but they never wandered. They always followed God. Okay? So if you think about this, as they are doing all of this, they have a physical manifestation of God right there with them. I mean, the pillar of a cloud is right there during the day. They can see this. God is providing for them, and God is taking care of them, and God is doing all this stuff. They had a display of God right with them, and God had been working among them. But before we get too hard on the Israelites, how short is our memory? when it comes to the great things that God does in our lives. You know, we, we come to Jesus Christ for salvation. He grants to us salvation, and then we think he can't do anything else. We think we have to solve the problem, just kind of like Moses, right? God says, okay, we're going to give the Israelites meat. Where am I going to get the meat, Lord? <laughs> Not up to you, Moses. 
We come to the Lord and we, we, God gives us something to do and we say, we can't do that, Lord. He says, I know you can't, but I can do it with you. I can do it through you. Our memory is just as short as the Israelites. But then we see in verse or chapter 14, it says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Boy, they had a pity party. Oh, we can't do it. There's no way. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. God, you brought us all the way out here just to kill us by the, the Canaanites? <laughs> just to kill us by the sword? Oh, I wish we'd have died in Egypt. Oh, I wish we'd have died in the wilderness. It would have been much peaceful to die in the wilderness than to have to go up there and fight and die in battle with the Canaanites. And our children are going to be taken captive, and our wives are going to be taken captive. Oh, this is terrible. I tell you what we'll do. Let's make us a leader, and we'll go back to Egypt. What were they in Egypt? Slaves. What are they saying? Let's go back to slavery. It was better than being out here free. Really? Well, verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their face before the, all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them which searched the land, rent their clothes. And they, that is Joshua and Caleb, spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Can you hear Joshua and Caleb? They rend their clothes, showing mourning. Don't do this, Israel. Please, we beg of you, don't do this. God is good and God is able to take us in and God can do it for us. These people's defense is gone from them. You think they have these big walled cities and you think they have these big strong giants? Their defense is gone because there's no defense against Jehovah God. And they're crying out and they're calling to the people. Verse 10, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. What were they about to do with Joshua and Caleb? Stone them to death. Why? Because they stood up for the Lord. They stood up for Jehovah. As I mentioned, they were loyal to Jehovah. Why were these two guys so loyal to Jehovah? Remember what we said about Joshua last week? In the birth order, what was Joshua? He was the firstborn son of the man named Nun. And he was in Egypt. And what happened to the firstborn during the plagues of Egypt? Those that were not under the blood were not passed over. Okay? There was Passover for those that had the blood. And one of those that got passed over and was not killed because of the blood was Joshua. He was grateful to the Lord. He knew that he owed the Lord a great debt. And he loved Jehovah. And because he loved Jehovah, he was willing to stand up. Again, think about the number of people we're talking about here. You got Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. There are four men. How many are complaining we said the population was about two to three million people. Four men! And two to three million people are about to pick up stones and cast them at you. Well, you know what? God intervened. Verse 10 continues, And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. God said, Wait a minute! 
and he's going to give instructions. You can you probably already know what those instructions were, but just to give you a quick summary, God says, everybody who rebelled against me is going to die in the wilderness. The only ones that are going to go in to the promised land are Joshua and Caleb. The ones that were loyal to me, the ones that stood up and said, God is able to do it. They're the only ones that are going to go in to the promised land. The rest of them are going to die in the wilderness. And folks, if you study it out, even Moses and Aaron are going to die in the wilderness. The only two that are going to go in are Joshua and Caleb. Joshua's loyalty to Jehovah put him at risk. He sided with God. He sided with Moses. And the people wanted to stone him. But God intervened. If you have your Bibles, turn over to the book of Romans, chapter number 13. Romans in the New Testament, Romans chapter 13. Verse 9, let's start with verse 9. It says, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in the saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. If I love my neighbor, you know what I'll do? I won't steal from him. I won't lie to him. I won't cheat him. I will obey the latter half of the Ten Commandments. Why? Because I love my neighbor, and love, as it says, works no ill. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. If we love our neighbor, we will keep that part of the law. How do we keep the first part of the law? If we love God the way we're supposed to, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Joshua loved Moses. And you know what that produced? It produced a loyalty to Moses. He didn't want anybody else taking Moses' spot. Whether that was good or bad, he just loved Moses. But greater than his love for Moses was his love for Jehovah. Because of his love for Jehovah, he was loyal to Jehovah even at the cost of his own life. Joshua served out of love, out of loyalty, and out of gratitude. And as we look at the life of Joshua, we're going to use this again as a model for our own life. Are we obedient to what God has said in his word? But then, if we think about it, what is the motivation behind our obedience? Our obedience should be driven by our love for God. Joshua served out of love, loyalty, and gratitude. We should too. But you know, we also find in this, if we think about love, God acts in love for humanity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because God loves us, you know what God does for us? He is faithful to us. He is loyal to us. That's why it says in the scriptures, he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Even those who don't trust in God today, they are loved by God. And God is giving them this moment, this hour, this day to turn unto Him. He calls unto them. He wants to redeem them. He wants to buy them back. He loves them so much He died on the cross for them. And He's going to remain faithful to His promise. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is is faithful. Do you trust Him today? Are you loyal to Him today? I pray you don't obey out of resentment 
or just because you think you have to. But we obey God because we love him. And why do we love him? Scripture says he first loved us. Joshua. He was obedient, but he was loyal, out of love. I pray that we too will find loyalty in love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day you've given to us again. We thank you for this time we have together, and I thank you, Lord, for your servant Joshua. Lord, we know he was a man. We don't want to exalt him above that, but Lord, he does set a great example for us. And Lord, as we see him standing there with Caleb, ready to give up his life, pleading for Israel to do the right thing, to trust you. God, I pray that we would take a similar attitude. And Lord, in this life, we may know that we may face adversity. We may even face death threats from time to time because we stand with you. But Lord, help us to stand there pleading that you are able to save, you are able to deliver, you are able to provide. And God, we just trust you in faith. <clears throat> Father God, I just pray that you'd receive all honor and glory and praise today. And we do pray for those that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Wherever they are today, I pray they will know how much you love them. We know that we can see that you loved Israel, Lord. You delivered them from Egypt. You provided for them all along the way in the wilderness. And you gave to them the promised land. And Father God, we know that you can deliver us from the slave market of sin. You can guide us through the wilderness. And Lord, you can help us to find the victorious Christian life in you. God, we just pray that all these things would work in accordance with your will. Again, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We praise you today. We thank you for your word. Help us to hide these things in our heart and to apply them to our lives that we could be drawn closer to you. And God, we want to give you all the honor and glory because you alone are worthy. We humble ourselves before you and we praise you today and ask that your will simply be done in this congregation and wherever your word is preached today. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. have a